in recent years, some of the most popular gifts are angels. Gift stores and bookstores, jewelry stores and craft shops are full of all sorts of angels. Wooden ones, brass ones, cloth angels, stained glass angels, angel earrings, angel charms, and even angel pins that I wore on my robe this morning. A walk through any mall holds an incredible variety of heavenly hosts. Each advent and Christmas season, a host of angels will grace our piano. Considering angels, believing in angels, or at least hoping for an angel has once again become acceptable. Instead of trusting only in our inner powers and self-guided insights, we seem to be opening up to the possibility that help might be available from another, from sources outside ourselves and higher than ourselves. Angels have been a part of all Western monotheistic religions since the beginning. There is a universal recognition between Judaism and Christianity that the one holy God over all uses some form of helpers to act as mediators between the exalted God and created earth. Good angels, fallen angels, avenging angels, helping angels have filled the centuries, the air for centuries. But with the birth of modern scientific methods and the age of reason, all these angels slowly began to bow out and fade away. Most of their tasks were assigned to the power of gravity and the laws of thermodynamics or the movement of atoms. And as we blithely banished angels from our worldview, However, we forgot that angels were primarily God's servants, God's messengers, God's feet and hands and mouth in our world. And perhaps the increasing and continuing popularity of those angel gifts is in fact the recognition that we are still desperately in need of angels, celestial companions who offer guidance and inspiration in our lives, visitor and visitations that come through dreams and visions, messengers who warn us about danger and trumpet God's love for our world and God's intentions for our lives. Robertson Davies sees the belief in angels as a healthful dietary supplement taken to stave off the most dreadful of all modern diseases, the rational rickets. Without adequate spiritual nourishment, we fail to thrive and fail to grow into a deeper relationship with God and with one another. Pierre Babin, director of the Center for Research and Communication in Lyon, France, points to George Lucas's parabolic film, Star Wars, as an illustration of our contemporary yearning for help from high places. Do you remember R2-D2? the one that protected Luke Skywalker? What makes Luke moral? A little robot, a kind of mini man, very humorous and yet also oh very wise and intelligent, who warned him of every danger, provided all of his information and conversed with his feeble conscience. What controls Luke Skywalker is a kind of modern electronic image of a guardian angel. Whether or not winged or wingless beings from some nebulous place between earth and heaven are in short supply, we still must take up the angelic role for ourselves. For an angel is a being who doesn't just know how to make a difference, an, actual, an angel actually does make a difference to make life count. The world needs more earth angels offering angel food and sustenance to one another upon this earth. The text from Thessalonians today both defines why all Christians may be considered earth angels and describes what is expected from an angelic witness. In 1 Thessalonians 2, 4, in the preceding epistle lesson, Paul specifically declares that he, and by inference we, as Christian believers, speak as those who have been approved by God to be entrusted with the message of the gospel. 
We are not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. Here is the Christian earth angel, the bearer of the greatest good news that God ever had to deliver to humanity. But there are more than mere words associated with being an earth angel. Angels are exceedingly busy beings. In the church angelology, these heavenly creatures were always intervening, interfering, interjecting, and simply meddling about in the events of men and women's lives. Paul goes on to describe his angelic activities among the Thessalonians as similar to a nursing mother gently caring for her own infant or a father tending his own children. This is a powerful image of the encouraging, comforting, nurturing, loving, selfless, even sacrificing attitude that Paul is trying to convey to the Thessalonians as he urges them to live lives worthy of God. The angelic spirit of doing and giving for the sake of others is summed up in verse 8. So deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel, but also our own selves. The depth of feeling treasured by Paul for the Thessalonians leads him to want to do anything that he can, offer anything that he has for their well-being. Paul knows that the most wondrous gift that he has to offer is in fact what God sent him to bring, the gospel. But with all the fervor of loving parents, Paul and his companions also feel called to offer their own selves as well, holding back no part of themselves because of their love and commitment to these new children of God. True angels giving angelic witness, come ready to give, ready to help, and ready to work. Angels come bearing angel food, a life-sustaining and enriching energy source that they share with complete abandon and with no thought of their own needs. It was a happy discovery that the sweet, soft, spongy cake that we have for so long called angel food cake is actually one of the few yummy morsels that is not bad for us. <laughs> Fat-free angel food cake is a dieter's sin-free dessert. And like devil's food, which of course is filled with egg yolks and oil and butter, just waiting to leap into our arteries and stick them shut. Beware the path that angels trod, however, as well as the path that angels fear to tread. When we as angels offer the angel food of the gospel and ourselves as nourishment to others, we are not always left unscathed as those dining on angel food cake. Paul's letter to the Thessalonians states that he has already suffered and been shamefully mistreated in Philippi. Doing for others is not always appreciated. And some people would rather shovel in thin, tasteless gruel of a self-centered life than to dare reach out and to try the sumptuous feast offered to them by the gospel. There is a downside to being an earth angel. Instead of one of those fluttery celestial beings envisioned in the Middle Ages, human angels, human messengers of the gospel can be fearfully wounded by those who reject or resent the angel food offered to them. Angels may be assured of God's continued love and abiding presence, but they are not guaranteed safe passage between earth and heaven. Ironically, it is from those angels whose own lives have been the most scarred and even sacrificed that the sweetest and most enduring angel food has ever been offered. During this week, try recognizing and identifying some members of the angelic host that populate this household of faith at Fairhaven and those who offer you angel food. In our church's life, in the life of our partnership, in your own life, angelic hope has come from whom? Be specific in your prayers of thanksgiving to God. 
This morning, we will name our triumphant saints, those of our family of faith who are no longer earth angels, but resurrected saints of the heavenly host. How did they share the gospel of our Lord with you, with all of us? And who are the guardian angels of our congregation? Whose wisdom guides and guards your path? Name them before God and give thanks for the angel food that they have given you and others. And if they are still earth angels, be certain to thank them for their presence in your life. Who are the herald angels? Who are always ready with an affirming and embracing word? Those in our household of faith who keep you going with encouragement and go for it courage. And who are the littlest angels in this family of faith? whose tiny faces and growing voices brilliantly reflect the love of Christ without inhibition, discrimination, or recrimination. Pray that they may grow in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and humankind. Who are the choir angels that feed others the sustaining music of God's love with their everyday witness? and harmonious living. May our lives be so tuned to the Holy Spirit as theirs. And who are the elder angels who have nurtured and loved us through oh so many generations? May we be faithful to the legacy of the gospel lived among us as they became lives that became the gospel. There's a classic on the Old Testament by Klaus Westermann entitled, God's angels need no wings. Sing the praises of wingless angels, earth angels, whose presence in our very midst raises our personal and collective life to a brighter image of the kingdom of God as the church of Jesus Christ. An old legend tells of three angels present at creation. And the first angel exclaimed to God, my Lord, what a wonderful, beautiful world. How did you do it? And that angel went on to become history's first scientist. The second angel proclaimed to God, my Lord, what a wonderful, beautiful world. Why did you do it? And that angel went on to become history's first theologian and philosopher. And the third angel declared to God, my Lord, what a beautiful, wonderful world. How may I help? That angel went on to become one of the founders of Fairhaven United Methodist Church. Thanks be to God. Amen.